Well, all of us having been introduced, uh, we'll start immediately, and I will direct the first reflective question to the President, which is, I think, both uh, an obvious question but an important one, which is quite simply, why hold an event of this kind on, on World AIDS Day at this moment? It is the question, though. I, I'm honored to answer it, and uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Bollinger, President Bollinger, and uh, Dean Freed for having us back at Columbia. And I want to thank our panelists. Uh, I think we should do it for two reasons. Because, number one, Americans have tended to grow complacent about the challenges in America and about what it would take for us to adequately meet them. And number two, Americans, I think, tend to assume that because of the dramatic increase in activity in the rest of the world, because of the Global Fund, because of the PEPFAR program that uh, President Bush initiated, because of the work of the Gates Foundation, and the work that our foundations do and others, that we're on the way to a complete resolution of this globally. And I don't think either one of those things is true. So I wanted to do that. In America, we have discrete populations of Americans where the AIDS infection rate is going up. We still don't have everyone on treatment. We still haven't done as much as we could do on testing and prevention and other things. And in the world, I think we can say with some conviction that no one will die of AIDS this year because the drugs are too expensive or in short supply, but a lot of people are going to die of AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis and coincident cases because of the absence of health care systems out there to, to do the testing, to do the education, to do the prevention work, to, do, to distribute the medicine, to do the follow-up. And that's what I hope we'll talk about today, uh, why we still need a World AIDS Day. And I'll just give you one example. We had a million people added to the treatment roles now. We have more than four million people in four countries throughout the world on treatment. Half of them on contracts our foundation negotiated, including uh, we have more than 200,000 children on pediatric medicine, which is more than 60% of all the kids in the world. But it's a tiny fraction of the children who need it, and it's still only barely over 40% of those in the world who need the medicine to stay alive. The rest of them are not getting their medicine, primarily because there are no delivery systems out there. So we need to talk about that, and we need to talk about how we've kind of let our attention slip here at home. Thank you, sir. Uh, Wafa, you've dealt so uh, widely internationally. Um, yesterday, WHO changed the guidelines on the initiation of treatment to begin it rather earlier, which means, I think, objectively, that there are probably something in the vicinity of over 10 million people who require treatment now, according to their guidelines, with only 4 million receiving it. There is tremendous anxiety in this country over what is described as the flatlining of the budget, uh, of the administration's budget, and the seeming pullback in providing the resources that are necessary to both sustain and increase the treatment. Uh, as a matter of fact, if this isn't presumptuous or untoward, uh, a group of quite thoughtful activist NGOs yesterday gave President Obama a D plus which is unusual, Mark, in this administration's history, for, for the response to AIDS. And there is, a, there is a very strong feeling that the slowing down in funding is going to compromise people's lives. Can you comment on all of that? Thank you very much, Stephen. I think um, if we step back and think about how we got to where we got, it was through tremendous mobilization. And clearly groups like... Um, have worked on this for years and years, including the President and the Clinton Foundation, ICAP and many others, have tried to mobilize the resources to make a difference. And it really is tragic to reach a point now where we can reach, we can make a difference. We're starting to see improvement in life, in life expectancy in countries like Botswana, decrease in mortality in countries like uh, South Africa, that we would, be, would not be able to 
to reach the finish line, essentially, and to really vanquish HIV, both in terms of treatment and prevention. Um, in reality, even without the change in the guidelines, the WHO guidelines, even without changing the guidelines, we still about have two-thirds of people who still need treatment today. So I think the bar is much higher, and um, it is, comes at a difficult time, at a difficult economic time, at a time when people are making choices between the domestic epidemic, the global epidemic, the other health threats that are facing the world. And in a way, it's a moment where we're, we're, we're stepping back, and we've been discussing today, this morning, at a full-day symposium, how HIV can catalyze the transformation of health systems. How can we use the resources better? How can we build on the foundation of what PEPFAR has established, what other people have funded and established. How can we build on that so that we can actually capitalize on the foundation to be able to reach to do much more? Nonetheless, without advocacy and without commitment of new funding, unfortunately there'll be people who are not going to get treatment. And unfortunately there'll be women who will not be treated and there'll be children who are not going to be treated. So, on World AIDS Day, we come together to re-energize all of us around the cause, around the cause of maintaining, sustaining the commitment, the global commitment to HIV, the global commitment to the health of poor people around the world, and the global commitment to transforming the health systems uh, around the world to systems that are humane, appropriate, high quality, and effective. Wafa, do you buy the argument which is more and more stated that too much money has gone to AIDS at the expense of other areas of health, particularly maternal and child health, and that there should be an extraction of some of the AIDS money for the other alternatives, given the financial crisis? Unfortunately, I find that uh, that argument is not useful. It's often divisive, and it and takes people who should be working on the same side, they put them into as enemies across the, across the line rather than together. And uh, I think the pie has to grow bigger. Uh, the commitment to health is very vital to commitment to development. And again, synergizing between HIV, child health, maternal health, together in the context of strengthening health system can actually get us all to achieve what we want. Um, so I, I think, again, it is not a useful argument, take away from HIV and put into something else. I think there are more potential for synergies and complementaries and growing together and solving problems together rather than pitting people who should be really battling the same battle together. May I say to colleague panelists that if they want to jump in on any discussion, please do so. And I saw you uh, smiling uh, thoughtfully to yourself, Virginia. Did you want to comment No, on I just simply was agreeing with the last comment that uh, it really becomes very divisive when we talk about whether or not uh, one approach or one disease should uh, be considered over another or if money should go in one area. Uh, the reality is we must remain focused, as the doctor said, on all of this. So that was the point of agreement for real. Well, let me take you further into the domis domestic scene, which is clearly important in this discussion. And I will admit to being an appalling ignoramus in, in, in the context of exactly what is happening in the United States. But but I get the sense, given that there were 53,000 additional, more than 53,000 new infections last year, and such uh, a disproportionate number within the African American community, and particularly amongst women, and the situation we've now learned is extant in Washington. Can you make comment on all of that from your policy viewpoint that you that you pursued? Well, I think uh, it is true that last year, when the Center for Disease Control released its report. Uh, it showed that there were far more new incidents of HIV than initially thought, 56,300. Among that population, we saw a disproportionate amount among people of color, African Americans, African American black gay men, MSMs, men who have sex with men, and black women. And I think that what it has shown is that we must make sure that we know exactly where the resources are going and that the resources are going into the areas of greatest need. And preliminary work that has been done by the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, of where I sit as the president and CEO, we're finding that that is not the case. 
and the disproportionate numbers that we're seeing among black women, but when we think historically, women of color and children have been heavily impacted by AIDS, HIV, since its inception. And black women showed unusual signs of AIDS very early on, but they were misdiagnosed or classified as prostitutes or not diagnosed at all. And now, only since 1992, when the Center for Disease Control expanded its definition to include not only tuberculosis, pneumonia, but stage three of cervical cancer, did we begin to see major changes for women living with AIDS. So I'm sure that those numbers are also uh, a part of what we're seeing now today. And as we look today, there are many issues that are impacting why perhaps we're seeing this disproportionate amount among especially black women. It goes to traditional relationship structures, which I'm sure many in the audience can agree with and know about. Uh, negotiating, the use of condoms. You know, uh, these men will tell you things. Baby, I'm okay. You know, uh, you can trust me. And uh, it's not always the case. We've got to push for uh, safer sex, use of condoms, getting people tested, knowing our partners, reducing the number of partners. All of those things are a part of, I think, where we need to be going today so that we can reduce the disproportionate impact within the African-American community generally and black women specifically. Khalid, do you want to enter into this discussion? Yes. Um, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about, um, you know, the, how we've grown since the beginning of the epidemic, since 1992. I think what we've seen is that we've done a lot of work to expand access to HIV testing technologies, access to medications for a great amount of people within the country. But knowing and understanding that there are still far too many individuals that don't have access to health care, uh, for the longest period of time, I've been fighting for early access to treatment for people with HIV before they progress to an AIDS diagnosis. Still in 2009, you have to have AIDS before you qualify for health care through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Even more uh, st astonishing to me is that over 70 percent of the individuals that are acquiring HIV in the United States are gay and bisexual men. We don't even have a way to access or provide information to them. Our comprehensive sexuality education in our schools doesn't speak to them. It doesn't provide them with the information that they need to protect themselves, to protect their families and communities. How can we really get control of the epidemic if we're not speaking in a language to the people that we need to talk to the most? And then when we talk about access to resources, where can we find affordable clinics? Where can we find affordable health care? Where can we find quality food and nutrition? And the areas that are most hardest hit by HIV, and that's in the, the poorest neighborhoods, in the Harlems, in the Detroits, in the areas of our country that are the most deracinated by poverty, how do we really speak to them and start to give them empowerment so that they can be able to control their own lives and control their um, susceptibility and vulnerability to HIV? Thank you. You know, it, it, uh, it, it occurs to me that we're beginning to respond to the issues of sexual minorities uh, internationally although very incrementally and in some ways there are uh, steps back when legislation is very punitive, particularly anti-gay legislation. Uh, but around women, we seem in many ways to be stalled. The disproportionate numbers of women, which is obviously a reality domestically as well as internationally, the world cannot adequately respond. Whatever it is that yields paralysis, the world around women, the, the, the gender inequality is so deeply entrenched we're just not making the kind of progress we have to make. We're still at 60, 61 percent of all of the, of the population that's infected in Africa, 23 million people, 60, 61 percent are women, and much higher percentages between the 15 and 24-year-old age groups. So where do we go around this particular issue, which is so vexing and so appalling? I'd like to say that I think a couple of things we should certainly look to do. First, let's begin with the message. We need to have messages that uh, relate to women across the board. I think there's still a certain uh, lot of misperception that only a certain level of women are becoming infected. Low-income women or women who are in the streets or women who are engaged in drug use. 
We need a message that speaks to all women that this is a disease that affects, potentially can affect all women. So that message must be directed to women of all ages, economic groups, geographical locations, and uh, as I talk, for example, and my, my organization will recognize this, uh, one of the women's organizations of which I'm a member of, the Lynx, service organization, Phenomena. And they had a convention about a year, last year. And for the first time, they had a session on AIDS. And the title was, What Does That, capital T-H-T, Have to Do With Me? And once we began to talk about it, the transmission of this disease and how it affects all women, that turned around that conversation to encourage many of those same women to be active at the local level, making sure that they get tested, they become more educated, and to get involved. So I think the message is important. And the messenger is also as, is important. We need to make sure that we're involved in women who are living with AIDS to be talking about these issues, to be at the tables making the decisions about budgets, about policies, about programs and services, and that they're not sitting on the sidelines when these kind of decisions are being made. And I think at least addressing the issues some from that perspective will lead us uh, in a direction that I believe is, is, is certainly needed at this time. Offer. I agree completely with, uh, with my colleague. I think the, the issue is one needs to always reflect on what is the cause of that vulnerability of women in our midst in the U.S. and globally. And it's, it's very complex. It has to do with vulnerability of women in general, not just to HIV. Um, there are lots of structural issues about poverty, uh, social issues, empowerment issues, uh, control of the, econ the economy, um, education access to a lot of opportunities within societies. Um, and I think in a way one, one has to think of the vulnerability of women in the context of the societies in which they exist. And unfortunately the societies often have not transformed themselves into equitable societies that really care about the women in a manner that can protect them. I, and in a way our interventions have been maybe too narrowly focused. We've thought, we've thought about the vulnerability in terms of uh, sexual exposure and protection uh, from a specific partner rather than thinking of our interventions much more broadly based, of really broad interventions, more of structural interventions that are necessary. In this country, for example, issues about, uh, you know, uh, in many rural areas in the south where many of the men are in prisons. The rates of imprisonment in our country is remarkable, especially amongst African-American men. The issues about the uh, educational system, disenfranchised uh, education of teenagers in schools and the quality of schools, all of these set vulnerabilities into motion. And I think we need to reflect and think much more broad based on how to protect women. I also think we can't focus on women alone. We have to focus on the role of men. Men are very important and when we're focusing on vulnerability of women, one also needs to bring the issues of boys and men and uh, keep them front and central. I think um, I, I was just talking about a program that we're trying to envision that I'm calling Men Matter. Men do matter when you're trying to work with women in the field, when you're trying to protect women. It's very critical that uh, boys are raised in a, in a society that uh, enables respect across the between boys and girls, and therefore respect between men and women, and that there can be then uh, the potential for generation of relationships of, of equity. And I think it's through these generations that hopefully we'll see a society where there's no violence, there's no sexual violence against women, there's no exploitation of women, there's protection of women, as well as also um, creating uh, much more of a harmonious societies and harmonious uh, communities around the world. Wafa, um, those are generational things. They take a lot of time, and the women are being infected now and are, are, are in such a compromised position now. Well, what do you do about internationally? What, what do you do about the uh, significant transmission of the virus through sexual violence, whether it's the politically orchestrated sexual violence of a Zimbabwe or the post-election violence in a Kenya or the terrifying violence of a Congo or a Darfur? 
uh, or indeed the kinds of studies that have just been done in Swaziland which show that young girls have been subject to an incredible degree of sexual violence within the home they thought before they did the study and it was a CDC study that it would be in the schools it turns out to be in the homes with with intimate partners and relatives H how do you how do you deal with those things uh, Wafa? how do we address them um, it's a very tough question and uh, but we have to address them today I, I think again we need to approach it at multi levels I think we have to have the laws that protect women the laws that punish the perpetrators of violence, uh, whatever that may be, that's very important. And then not only have the laws, but also respect those laws and, 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 and take them to action so that people feel that they're going to be responsible for their actions. And then we need to work with the women themselves to empower them to speak up, that this is not the norm, this is not what should happen, that this is actually uh, aberrant behavior that should be stopped, and to enable them through working we do it through working of uh, women's groups, for example. Women come together and one woman is able to speak up and she creates that environment where other women can speak up and lo and behold, you have a group of women who are speaking up and saying no. And I think it's an incremental process that can, will take, will not happen overnight, but I think it has to be at multi-levels, at all levels of society, uh, so that we can be working at all these levels so we can change and transform and protect these women. From these very horrific, from these very horrific uh, events. Mr. President, you've been so deeply involved in all of this as you've traveled. Did you make remarks on this? Well, first, I think <clears throat> I think it's important to have uh, individual role models who are respected and who speak out. And I agree with what Virginia said. In uh, Lesotho and several other countries where we work, the most effective people are young people who are HIV positive who talk about it and refuse to be victims. Keep in mind, a lot of the developing countries, there's still a lot of stigma attached to it and there's still a lot of fear and just having people say, okay, here are the facts. I was raped and I'm, I've got AIDS and medicine's keeping me alive and I refuse to be a victim is incredibly liberating to women who hear that, to young women. Same thing is true for young men. I mean, I wish that today on World AIDS Day, we had, if I thought of this, I wish we had 100,000 personal stories on Facebook and YouTube and all these websites, you know, just people, and, and also with men saying, I'm, I've got AIDS and it's really wrong for me to destroy women's lives or other men's lives and not behave responsibly. Just, we just need to flood this out there. And in the developing world, it's highly uh, empowering to have individuals. Then I think getting these groups are important. I remember when I was president, I went to Africa in my second term, and um, Hillary had been working on this whole issue of female genital mutilation. And she started by getting women's groups, and then there was always, every time there was a women's group, there was an auxiliary group of men who supported them. And pretty soon, just because somebody like us showed up and blessed them and they got publicity, they couldn't be punished anymore. They couldn't be isolated anymore. They couldn't be marginalized anymore. I think a lot of this stuff happens uh, not according to some real script, but almost organically it comes up if you can start it in the right direction. And uh, the, the changing the culture is really hard. And I'm, I'm, I confess, you know, mostly we focus on just getting out there and testing people and getting them the medicine when they need it and getting the children the nutritional support and all. we ought to talk about that in a minute both in America and elsewhere but I, I've seen this make a difference and I think it's the only thing that will make a difference because we all know that people are most at risk of communicating the virus shortly after they get it when they're least likely to have been tested and found positive so this is really important that we do this agreed uh, Kelly, I think you wanted to enter this fray. Yeah, I, I think um, it would be wonderful if we got to the point where we could have 100,000 stories on Facebook, but we all know that one of the reasonable barriers to having 100,000 personal stories on Facebook is the, the stigma that's attached to that, as President Clinton was just talking about. You know, for myself, I also know that as soon as I, you know, tell people that I'm a person living with 
AIDS at the age of 29, who found out that he had AIDS at the age of 23 after being diagnosed with AIDS in an emergency room hospital with 104 degree temperature, almost losing my life, that there will be a lot less invitations to birthday parties and, and social events after this because there is still a stigma attached. Nobody wants to necessarily be associated with an individual or with the AIDS virus, and we have to do something about creating realistic and honest conversations in our country to, able, to be able to do something about the epidemic. We have to talk about sexuality. We have to talk about economic and structural barriers. We have to talk about the quality of education and what's going on in our communities and societies because only when we're able to have those conversations and when we're able to really respond to what's going on on the streets of our communities and when we can respond from love. You know, with all due respect to President Clinton, I think um, one of the things that we saw during the recent election was just the amount of celebration around the world from a, a, a tenor and a message that talked about things that we can do instead of things that we can't do. And I think we need to find every opportunity to talk to people about how we can expand what we're able to do in, in this country, how America can again act as a leader in the fight against AIDS instead of following, you know, in other individuals' footsteps. How can we step out in the forefront and teach the world how to take control of AIDS and er truly eradicate it from our communities? Go ahead, Virginia. And to add to what a colleague just said with respect to stigma, there's also a sense of complacency. And we find this uh, to be a tremendous barrier as we work throughout this country in the 12 or more cities where the National Black Leadership Commission of AIDS now have its affiliates. There's a sense of complacency that HIV AIDS no longer problem. Part of it is what people see on the television, they see on the billboards, if uh, this person is living with it, they're okay, and all I have to do is take my medication. Not understanding, again, as we know, there is no cure for HIV. So this sense of complacency seems to be uh, allowing or uh, people are more comfortable with having unprotected sex and risking other ways of contracting the disease than perhaps they should be. So we've got to break through that. Also, people don't believe, for example, I was doing a radio show earlier this morning on WWRL, and every time I talk about the 9.5 minutes that CDC states a new person will become infected with AIDS. And as I was looking at my watch, I think I've been here at Columbia University for about 90 minutes. So that's probably about what, about 10 or 9 more new persons who've become infected since we have been in this place today. People don't believe the numbers. The numbers are staggering. So we must do more to talk about it. We must keep it in the forefront. We must do more of getting comprehensive sex education in our public schools as we are seeing the increase of sexually transmitted infections among younger people. We must talk about sex. And uh, I think the, the role of the black clergy is playing in all of this is really making a difference in many of the cities where we are working. One of the things which is true of the United States is that, and, and my country of Canada, is that there are very, very few children who are ever infected. But in the world at large, the reality of the need to treat children and the hundreds of thousands of children who are born HIV positive still every year, we haven't really talked about children. And one of the things that the Mailman School did, Wafa, I remember that uh, when, when, when Alan Rosenfield was, was, uh, was dean, the emergence of the PMTCT+, plus, the Prevention of Mother-to-Child Transmission+, plus, where the focus shifted in significant measure to the mother, uh, something that the world had paid little attention to until that moment. Um, Wafa, we're still seeing this uh, terrible uh, number of kids infected year after year when the intervention through drugs should be pretty easy. Do you want to, do you want to d just discuss that? We haven't talked about children. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, one of the, I mean, there have been a lot of advances over the past several years and I think we need to really celebrate them. I think we can't forget how much progress has happened. But in the arena of children with HIV, we have a ways to go. And, um, I think it requires, and what we've tried to do at ICAP is reconceptualizing uh, the whole concept of how mother-to-child 
prevention of mother to child transmission should be done by thinking of the mother, by thinking of the family as the unit of action and, um, and shaping the interventions and shaping the program so actually it can be a family approach so that women, pregnant women can come into care, into any little care, get the attention they need, get tested, get the care they need for their own health as well as to enable protection of their children. But nonetheless, I think in, a, in many ways, we fail to make the connections that every single woman, every single pregnant woman gets tested, every single pregnant woman gets the care she needs, and every single pregnant woman needs to take what protects her child, and her child needs to get the access to the treatment that they need. And that's where I think we need to continue to mobilize the resources to be able to reach literally millions of, of, of children at risk or infants at risk uh, without having this enormous expansion of programs that are focused around prevention and transmission. I think it has to, in many ways, unfortunately, we've thought of prevention of mother to child transmission as a, as a little island by itself. And uh, we have to bring it back into a holistic approach of comprehensive care to families with HIV. And maybe if we put it into that framework and bring it into the mainstream of HIV programs, we actually might be uh, more effective in reaching, uh, in prevention new transmissions, but also in bringing children uh, who are already infected to get access to the treatment thanks to the work of the president and his foundation in providing access to those treatments. Uh, but I, I do think that it's going to require a concerted effort. And there are lots of partnerships, new partnerships that are happening around the world to try to help in reconceptualizing uh, protection of children and protection of families. I, I, I want to make a quick confessional so I can sleep tonight. The, the people with whom I work do not use prevention of mother to child transmission. I'm using it because it's an easy phrase. We use vertical transmission because we refuse to demonize the mother. Uh, nobody ever asks who infected the mother. So when you say mother to child transmission, you're immediately demonizing women, which is a, a constant pattern in this world of which we want no part. But, but the truth is that the, that the pediatric AIDS dimension is something, Mr. President, that you've thrown the foundation into, which was terribly neglected before you began to enter that arena. And it would, I remember seeing you in Lesotho when you were dealing with kids, and, and I, I, it may be worth saying something about. Well, let me say, first of all, I, on the prevention of mother to child, I, the thing that I have seen is if you have some sort of basic network out there and you get the word out, mothers don't want their kids to be born with HIV. I mean, they're very responsible. All you have to do is empower them to take this medicine. And I will say again, one of the things that I think we have to do, I, I agree with what you said uh, about not wanting to get AIDS in a fight with somebody else for limited dollars. But one of the things that we see is if you build elemental health care networks in very poor areas where they don't exist, everything gets better. You know, the AIDS program gets better, the malaria, tuberculosis, maternal and child health. Somehow somebody shows up and some tropical diseases get treated that didn't get treated. I mean, I, just, I think this is an opportunity to overcome the uh, and part of the problem that the activists had with uh, President Obama's budget. I, I think that for whatever it's worth, I personally strongly disagree with the, the condemnation because if you look at the circumstances that they're facing with the budget and the other options we have to increase care, including taking the food security budget and setting aside some for nutritional programs that specifically target people with HIV and AIDS and especially children and a lot of other things that can be done. I think we, we can do more with this budget than people think. And you got in Eric Goosby, I think you've got a guy running this uh, PEPFAR office who's really committed to doing the right thing. But anyway, I, I think um, I, I think that the mother to child transmission. Every place where in our HIV AIDS people, and uh, Anil Sony's here today, and maybe some other people from our initiative, they're really working hard on this. But what we find is if you create a, a, an opportunity, they do show up. 
If you say, look, this is a problem here, you just empower people. They show up. They make good things happen. They say, okay, test me. Give me the medicine. You know, we, we don't have, when your children get involved, you don't have many of the reservations that still obtain about the stigma and the other things that you previously thought. At least that's our experience. So I know I sound like a broken record, but my honest belief is we do have nutritional problems. But the medicine, the medical treatment for the kids is about 60 bucks a year now. The mother-to-child transmission treatment, is, you all know, is not very expensive. The, what we got to do is to find an affordable and predictable revenue stream that will allow the building of these health care networks to continue. Uh, I think in the developing world that's the most important thing. Now here it's a different story, but there uh, I believe we can make breathtaking progress on mother-to-child transmission if you have the people out there in enough places. And essentially, you got the global fund, you got all, and PEPFAR, to be fair, is increasingly spending some of its money on health systems. Unitaid, which was set up to buy diseases of the poor, you know, funded primarily by the French airline tax, uh, decided that originally they were going to be just 100% in the medicine business. They give us a very small percentage of the overhead uh, to help build out the networks to deliver the goods. Uh, but that's something I think we should all be thinking about. Do we really uh, has our laudatory focus on medicine uh, or nutrition or anything else undermined uh, our f awareness that there has to be, and we're not talking about expensive systems here, but just elemental systems for uh, medical distribution, checking on the, the adherence, the, you know, freezing the blood sample or refrigerating the blood samples and transporting them. Just stuff that doesn't cost a lot of money but makes all the difference in life and death out there. That's what I think we should be focusing on more in the developing world. Well, that's a good speech, young man, and I appreciate it, and I actually intend to speak to her about it. But what would you do if you were the president? You, maybe you'd say, well, he shouldn't spend any money in Afghanistan. But uh, the, the, we have this oh, – wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I wouldn't say that, by the way. I, <laughs> I, but I'm very sympathetic with the problem he's in. He just spent $800 billion – and the Congressional Budget Office today said it created between, I think, 600,000 and a million and a half jobs. He's in a terrible bind. He has to get this money from China. They're trying to reform the health care system. I personally believe that, that you can't have universal health insurance in a way that does not benefit people with HIV and AIDS. I think if we get universal health care out there, it will help a lot to fund the network that we need that will improve care for people with HIV and AIDS. And I, if, and I haven't talked to anybody. I didn't know anything about this, I must tell you. That to, and I, I respect your request. I've, I'm embarrassed to tell you I didn't know what the budget request was until I started doing the preparation for World AIDS Day. So I have no idea what the White House response is, but I know this, if they pass that health care bill, you're going to get a lot more money spent on HIV and AIDS. And if we pass the Food Security Initiative, we're going to have a lot more nutrition aid for people with HIV and AIDS around the world. Yes, I will speak to them, but I, I, I want to tell you, the President's had a nightmare economic situation, and the Congress is coming down on him day and night while he's trying to get universal health care, which would help people with HIV and AIDS. And He's also cut back on some of Hillary's development budget, which I didn't like either. We all don't like it, you know. But I've been there, and somehow he's got to deal with this. I will speak with them. I, I, I think that they may think the America's done so much more than everybody else they can slow down a while. I don't agree with that. But let's look and see where there's other money that we might get. Uh, let's look and see whether – what if we shifted some money into the global fund – where every dollar we put up is supposed to be matched by two dollars from some uh, from other sources, are they prepared to do that? Should we do more multilaterally in this regard? Uh, let's look and see whether if the food security initiative that the president has basically charged 
Hillary was developing and implementing, if that, how much of that money could be used for people with HIV and AIDS in the poor countries. I think you've got a legitimate point. Look, the last thing we need to do is back up. We've only got, we're only treating 42% of the people who need this medicine to stay alive, and a smaller percentage of the children. And every time I give a speech and I say that our, our partnership with Unitate is treating two-thirds of all the poor children in the world who are getting medicine, and people clap, I make them stop. Because then I tell them what a lousy percentage it is of the total number of kids who need the medicine to stay alive. So I am extremely sympathetic with what you said. But I also have to defend the miserable position the president and his budgeteers are in under these circumstances. And just remember, at least in America, if we get this health care thing, it will improve AIDS care. It will. If we change the Medicaid guidelines to comport with the testing recommendations, which they can probably do by executive action. I bet Kathleen Sebades can do that on arm. That'll make a huge difference. There are other things we can do, and I promise you, now that I am aware of this, I will do my best to squeeze more blood out of the turnip. And I thank you. Well, I, I, I want personally to thank the obstreperous intervention from, uh, I think, a health gap uh, colleague, because you're a hell of a lot better than the moderator. Uh, you, Keeps you, us from being so boring, too. I, it's, no, it was really good. Thank you. Uh, any, other, any other heckling spasms that uh, you would like to invoke, please don't. Oh, my God. I didn't. I, I'm. Well, well, let's take a moment and raise. Let's take a moment then and raise the fact that we're now entering into the concentrated epidemics of uh, men having sex with men, sex workers, and injecting drug use, and the harm reduction programs. And this fellow is talking about needle exchange. Well, I can, let me just say this. First of all, we should also give the administration credit for changing this policy on people with HIV and AIDS coming to America. I'm ashamed that it happened, that it was, it was present when I was there, and I think they're right. And that's why we're going to get the uh, International AIDS meeting here. Uh, I changed my position on needle exchange. I think it's the right, I think it'll save lives. And I think the, uh, the thing that, one of the things that at least we ought to do is maybe get the as I remember, the, the Republican Congress went and the president went, uh, the then president, took away the local option from the District of Columbia. Or tried, isn't that right? And I think that at a minimum, since a lot of these problems are highly concentrated in urban areas, uh, if they don't want to fade their seat now, one of the things you might consider doing that I would strongly support is giving this decision back to the community AIDS uh, networks and the local governments involved and because I think there's no question what we do here in Harlem there's no question what we do in most of New York City no question what would happen in Washington DC where we've got a terrible problem on our hands and uh, so I agree with you I think this is a decision made by people who live in the areas where it's not a problem and people are queasy about drug use that affect the lives of people who live in areas where it is a problem. And if they don't want to come out and flat out endorse needle exchange, you ought to ask them to give it back and have a local option. And I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of our communities, our, our Harlem AIDS clinic here, I think you know, we could make a lot of good happen out of that. Uh, are, I, I, I anticipated that there might be others who couldn't be restrained. Well, if we do any more in America, we couldn't do it without adding that. Uh, what we're doing around the world is providing care for anybody that shows up that needs it, including men who have sex with men. Everywhere else, everywhere we work, we try to treat whoever needs the medicine to stay alive without discrimination and do outreach to all the populations that need it everywhere in the world we work. We have not been particularly active here in the United States. And I, one of the reasons I want to have this meeting today 
is that I think we all, uh, not all of us, not the, the other panelists, but people like me who think we know and care a lot about this, got a little too casual about the problem sneaking back up on us in America and assuming dimensions that were not properly being managed. So the short answer to your question is, if I can figure out someplace we can make a contribution consistent with our obligations around the world, which are very large and include selling medicine in 70 countries and having public health networks in more than 30, yes, I would do that. And in other countries, we do that right now. And we should. Everybody should. Can I just make the point and abuse the moderator's privilege for a moment to say that uh, the mantra, the slogan for World AIDS Day this year is universal access, which meant full treatment prevention and care by the end of 2010, which is obviously not going to happen, and human rights. And one of the phenomenal moves backward that is presently occurring internationally on human rights is what is happening to men who have sex with men in Uganda in the light of a new bill, a private member's bill that's been introduced into the parliament without the objection so far of the president or of his cabinet, so it is a proceeding apace. It's a bill which not only prescribes life imprisonment for anyone who's gay, but it also demands of everyone in the society, whether parent or teacher or doctor or nurse or civil society activist, whomever, if they suspect or know a person, man or woman, child, a boy or girl who may be gay, they are to report it to the authorities within 24 hours. And on top of that, any HIV positive gay man who has sex with another gay person is subject to the death penalty. It's the most hideous erosion of human rights and speaks to the, the phenomenon that 77 countries in the world have sodomy, anti-gay laws, and 40 of those 53 countries are in the Commonwealth, and it is in fact becoming a very serious issue in the combat of AIDS in the concentrated epidemic among men who have sex with men. Uh, I've been given the signal for one final question. Can I ask each of you quickly to, uh, to give a, a, a brief sense of where we should now go if we were speaking to young people in particular? What is, what is the battleground? How do, we, how do we wage this fight hereafter? Let, let's start with Kali and we'll move across quickly. I think that's, uh, for me, really simply just love, access, and uh, education. You first have to teach people that um, there is love out there, there's opportunity out there for them, and that those individuals that are being lost to the system, that are being lost to our educational systems, that are being lost to poverty, that are being lost to homelessness because they've come out in their, their homes and have been ejected from their households and forced to face life on their own like so many people that I found sitting outside of the Ruth Ellis drop-in center in Detroit, Michigan, who were 13 and 14 and outside at 4 o'clock in the morning without a roof over their heads because they came out to their parents. We have to establish a system of love in our country and adapt zero tolerance for any type of abuse or neglect to any children in this country. We have to provide comprehensive and appropriate education to our children so that they know how to compete in our global economy, in our global economy but also so they have life skills so that they can take care of themselves in this world and in, the, in this country. And lastly, they have to have access to health. They have to have access to quality and affordable education, not only on the primary and secondary level, but they also have to have access to higher education to be competitive in this world. And finally, they have to have access to health care. With 50% of people not having access to health care in this country, 21% who don't know that they're infected, and 29% who have HIV, who just can't get access to the medications that will keep them alive, is absolutely intolerable in this, in the, in this country, in the United States of America. And we have to do something about that today. Thank you. I agree. And I agree fully. And I will also say on the government side, we have to invest in prevention. I think roughly the budget now allows roughly about 4% toward prevention. And uh, when we invest in prevention, to make sure that the resources are going to those areas and communities of greatest need so that we can do the outreach, we can provide the education, we can work with uh, the women, the girls, men who have sex with men and young gay 
uh, men now who are also increasing, uh, the numbers are increasing in terms of infection. So while we do the work on the treatment, the care, the housing, which is necessary, and we must continue. And, but we must focus on what can we do on the prevention side so we can begin to keep the numbers down. And the best way I know, working through uh, many of the faith and community-based organizations and partnering with health departments throughout the country and working with other groups who are focused on these kind of issues, outreach, education, getting people educated, getting people tested. We've got to do more in terms of getting people tested. Here in New York State, we're continuing to work to try to turn the um, public law around with respect to routine testing. We need to have routine testing and not have barriers to people uh, getting routine testing. And of course, we have to look at something we've not said much about today, but I think we have to give much more attention, and that is the incarcerated population. As more people are being released from prisons, coming back into the communities, uh, reestablishing relationships across the board, we must be concerned. I know Congresswoman Maxine Waters has some phenomenal legislation to address this. We need to get behind that legislation that will require testing going in and testing coming out. And lastly, I would say on behalf of the many clergy members who are working on these issues across the country, there's a very important piece of legislation, H.R. 1964, the National Black HIV AIDS Elimination Act that is designed to address much of what we are talking about here today. The disproportionate impact of HIV AIDS within the black community, including MSMs, must be addressed by people who have the experience, have the knowledge, and have invested in making this legislation a reality. It's comprehensive, it's bold, and it touches upon all of the areas that we've been discussing today. So legislation is important. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with the previous two speakers. I, I do think um, we know what works. I mean, we know what works in prevention, we know what works in treatment, and we need to use our knowledge, the evidence we have, and go out there and implement it where it's needed, and scale it up. Like the President was saying, we need to take it to action, and we can't wait. We need to take those needle, needle exchange works, we need to take it to action, we need to take it to scale working with communities of MSMs and African-American communities can work and we need to take that to scale. We have interventions that we know work, but we haven't taken them to scale, we haven't implemented them. And I think there's a very important other area that we need to invest in that hasn't been mentioned before, and that's research. There are lots of unanswered questions, there are lots of ways, I mean, we've made enormous progress through research and discovery in terms of how to tackle this epidemic and how to prevent the horrific effects of the epidemic on people. But there needs to be a continued investment in research, research into new ways of how to prevent, effective ways of preventing transmission, and then research in better treatment for people living with HIV, research in how to do operations, how to implement these programs, how to scale them up, how to develop these networks, whether they be in New York, or in Harlem, or in Lesotho. Uh, there's a, a lot of room for inquiry and um, and knowledge generation that I need to continue, we need to continue to push on learning more, because I think through learning more, we'll be able to do more. Thank you. Mr. President. Well, <clears throat> first, I agree with what's been said. I, I particularly want to emphasize the importance of listening to people in discrete populations, whether it's men who have sex with men, whether it's women who have sex with the lovers who just got out of prison, but whatever. I think you have to listen to whether it's kids that are in at-risk populations and turn off all the messages because they look like they come from old gray-haired people like me and it's boring. We have to figure out a way to reach people. And I, I particularly think that we have made a colossal oversight not doing more with the imprisoned population in general. 
I mean, in jail, 90% of the people in jail are getting out. And now, of course, there's all this controversy over this terrible incident of the shooting of the police officers in Washington and whether that man's sentence should have ever been commuted in Arkansas and whether he could have been held in Washington. I don't know about the facts, but, but most people's release from prison is automatic. It has nothing to do with the intervention of a clemency. 90% of the people who are there are going to get out. And we spend all this money to warehouse them, put them with people of the same sex, uh, I think even now, only Mississippi, uh, unbelievably, is the only state in the country that allows conjugal gig, uh, visits for heterosexual couples. I think they still are. And so, and by and large, that education is limited. Uh, there were scores of, of, of great college education programs in prison and an almost zero recidivism rate until 1995 when the Republican Congress and one of their first acts after taking the majority was to prohibit Pell Grant funds from being used to defray the cost of a college education. So now uh, they went from scores down to about 11, four of which are in New York, I'm proud to say, thanks to an NGO here. But we need to go back and go f back to square one on this prison population and really try to dramatically reduce either the number of people who are infected while they're in prison or their uh, inclination out of desperation, spite, or whatever to infect others when they get out. I think that's important. Abroad, I know I sound like a broken record, but I've just seen it too many times. You train a few community health workers, you have basic, uh, I mean very basic refrigeration and lab facilities, you build national networks, and we'll get the medicine out there, and we'll get the money for it out there, and we'll save the lives. Uh, I will do what I promised the gentleman over there to do about the budget, but in the meanwhile, I hope you'll hold your fire. They've still got a few cards to play, and the president's in a terrible situation. I do think we will wind up doing more here, and I think it's imperative that we do. We, you can't be satisfied with the fact that we increased uh, from three to four million in treatment last year when there's still more than five million who need it. And we just got to keep working on driving the prices down, driving the quality up, and getting the systems out there. That's what I believe in the rest of the world. In America, it's more a set of discrete challenges. Thank you. Let me, on, on your uh, collective behalf, uh, ask you to exert one further round of appreciation for our panel.